God doing right now? The Bible tells us what God did during the first seven days of creation. He spoke and there was light and he divided the land and the sea. And then the Bible says on the seventh day God rested and then down through the centuries we, we have records of what God is doing. What is God doing right now? John chapter 5 records Jesus' words when he said, my father is always working. God doesn't take, God doesn't withdraw. He doesn't say, well, I, I'm through with everything. I'm just watching and observing. God is always working. And I'd like for us tonight to look quickly at some things that God is doing now. Some things that God is doing right now. So would you open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 5. I'll talk fast if you'll listen fast. And I want us to look together at what Jesus did here in this passage where he encountered a man named Matthew. Now, when we get to these verses, you're going to see that his name is Levi, but Levi and Matthew are the exact same person. Don't be confused by that, but we know him better by the name of Matthew. Luke chapter 5 verse 27 says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet for him at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were guests with them. But the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus replied to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. And I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. These, these brief verses show us some things that Jesus did then and that he is doing now. First, what is Jesus doing? He is drawing people into a relationship with him. Here in this passage, Matthew was going through his ordinary daily schedule. He was a tax collector, and he was receiving taxes. He was looking at his ledgers and collecting the money and depositing in it. And then he encountered Jesus at that tax table. Jesus appeared to him and said, you come follow me. Leave everything that you have behind you and come be one of my disciples. Jesus is doing the same thing today. He does the same thing every day. There's not any day that people breathe air on this planet that Jesus does not speak and draw people into a relationship with him. He is seeking us. He comes looking for people who are separated from him and draws them into a relationship with him. I live in Columbus now, but I grew up in West Point. And God blessed me with such a great neighborhood go growing up because it wasn't just the street where I lived, the entire block had all kinds of boys and girls about the same age. And so it, it, we ha always had plenty of friends to play with. And we would come home from school and go down to the Burns yard or, or somewhere else. And we would play baseball or football or things like that. And then in the summertime, it was not unusual for one of us to wake up and hop on our bicycles and start pedaling around to see who else was awake. We would stop and try to get a mom to fix us something for lunch, maybe some sandwiches. If we couldn't find a mom to make us something to eat, we would roast a little animal we had found on the side of the road. And then we would go back home when the sun started dipping behind the horizon. Now, there were some childhood games that we played. And in those games, at best, I was average. But there were some games that we played in our neighborhood in which I excelled. I was superior. Spin the bottle. I was amazing at spin the bottle. I loved playing it and always, it, it, it always liked those days, especially if we could convince a girl to play with us. And so if not, we would just sit and awkwardly stare at each other. And so I was superior in spin the bottle, but my best game as a child growing up was hide and seek. I'm an amazing hider. Now you can't tell it because of all the muscles that I have now, but when I was younger, I was tiny. And so it would not be unusual for the person who was it to give up because he or she could not find me. 
And, and so I could squeeze into places where, where people would say, there's no way that anybody could be in there. And that's exactly where I would be. And so the person would say, Gary, I give up. Where are you? I'd say, I'm in this keyhole. And I would make my way and go back to base. I loved playing hide and seek. As long as I was hiding. The hiders have the easy job. All the hiders have to do is go to a place where they do not think that they will be found and remain still and quiet. That is all the hiders have to do. The seeker is the one who has the hard job. When we were playing hide and seek, the seeker is the one who would have to go into the turnip seed yard and look in that elaborate landscaping that they had to see if anybody had slipped in there. The seeker is the one who would have to go into the Adam's yard and go into the back to see if, if someone had gone into one of the storage sheds that they had in their backyard. The seeker is the one who would have to go into the Smith's yard and see if anyone had climbed up in the, the tall tree limbs and was hiding up there. The seeker is the one who would have to go to the Allen's yard and the Pruitt's yard. He would have to go to the McCary's yard, the Scruggs' yard, the Fields' yard, the Tate's yard, the Dawson's yard. The seeker had to go everywhere within the boundaries, and his job was not done until every missing person was found. God is the seeker. God is the one who goes looking for people. And he does not stop until every person is home. And here in this passage, Jesus saw a man named Matthew who was just going about his ordinary daily business. And he encountered him. And he said, come to me. And that's what God's doing right now. To any person who doesn't know him, Jesus says, come follow me. It's what he's doing in this very minute. He's doing something else, though. In this passage, he not only called Matthew into a relationship with him, he also told him to leave his tax table behind him. Now, literally and um, in, in reality, Matthew was sitting at a tax booth. I don't want to take the time to go into all of the explanations, but the Jewish people hated the, the tax collectors. They considered them traitors. It would be the same thing as if China came over here and, and defeated the United States of America and then said, hey, we need money to take, we need people to take money from Americans and send it back to China so that we can still live our luxurious lifestyles. If any of us said, hey, you can put me down for that, we would look at that person as a traitor. How could you turn against your own countrymen and send money back to China? Well, that's what Matthew was doing with the Roman government. He betrayed his own people because he wanted to get wealthy. And tax collectors were known to be crooked and deceitful. They were known to live at wild, rowdy lifestyles. And if you see what the Bible says here, after Jesus called Matthew in verse 28, so leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Matthew knew that he was at a fork in the road. He could stay at his tax table and not follow Jesus. Or he could follow Jesus and leave his tax table, but he could not do both. He could not go where Jesus wanted him to go as long as he remained at his tax table in his old lifestyle. When Jesus invades our hearts, he doesn't come in just to dust a few corners off here or there. Jesus comes to revolutionize us. He comes to take what is dead and make it alive. He comes to take what is old and make it new. He wants to change us. And call us to live in a way that is different from the way that we used to live. In high school, one of the clubs that I belonged to, Future Nerds of America, every year had, and I was president three years in a row, every year we did a fall 
festival type carnival for one of our one of our senior citizen homes there in in West Point and so on this particular night we had gotten everything ready and went out there and we had these little games that they could play you know you could fish for something and we would attach something to the hook and they would get you know a little prize or things like that and so we had we had finished all of the the games and activities and it was still early you know they served supper at 3 30 and so we still had plenty of time after it was after you know the activities were over before before we had to go back home and so as we were unloading up the tables and all of the other supplies I heard a group of people who were discussing what they were going to do and one of the people in that group was a friend of mine named Carla O'Brien she had grown up right up the street from me and so I heard them discussing what they were where they were going and so I walked up to Carla and I said hey what are y'all doing and Carla looked at me and said, she said Gary you're not going I said what what do you mean she said Gary where we're going and what we plan to do when we get there. That's not who you are. Don't go with us. As people surrender their lives to Jesus Christ, there are times that they wander back into their old ways. And Jesus says, that's not who you are. I called you to leave the tax table behind you. But if you were honest tonight, you would admit I'm still sitting at the tax table. There are things that I'm doing that I know displease Jesus Christ. They're part of the way that I used to be. And Jesus is calling us to leave the tax table behind us. It's what he's doing right now. We don't have to wait for him to do it on Sunday. We don't have to hope that he does it tomorrow. He's doing it right now. He's drawing people into a relationship with him. He's calling those who know him to leave their tax table ways behind. And third... He's sending people out to broken lives. I love the natural progression in this passage. After Matthew had his life-changing encounter with Jesus, look at what the Bible tells us down in verse 29. Then Levi, or Matthew, hosted a grand banquet for him at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were guests with him. Now remember what I told you Matthew did for a living? He was a tax collector. He was someone who had turned his back on his own people. He lived that rowdy lifestyle. He plunged himself into the gutters of immorality. And Jesus changed him. And there's not even a verse between the two. Immediately, as soon as Matthew realized, I've been forgiven of my sin. I have been made a brand new person. The very first act he did was to say, Jesus... Look at all these other friends of mine who also were sitting here at their tax tables. When work finishes today, I know where they're going. And I know what they're going to do when they get there. Jesus, they're not church-going people. We'll never get them to come to the temple. They... They don't like going to church, but I tell you what, they do like going to a party. And so, Jesus, if I have a party at my house, will you come and do for them what you did for me? Will you make me brand new? Will you make them brand new? The way you made me brand new. And that's what Jesus is doing right now. He's calling people who have been redeemed. 
He's calling people whose lives have been changed. He's calling people who are aware that their sins have been forgiven to go to people whose sins haven't been forgiven. He's calling people whose lives have been put back together to reach out to people whose lives are still broken. He's doing it right now. He hasn't folded his arms and said, I hope they somehow survive. He's working right now in every one of those three ways and he's working I'm convinced in one of those three ways in every single life here I don't think there's a I don't think there's a there's one exception I think that one of those three specific ways applies to all of us What is Jesus doing in you right now? What is he saying to you right now? Musicians are going to come and they're going to lead us in a closing song of commitment tonight. And I would like you to consider responding in one of three ways. First, is there anyone here who senses the voice of the Spirit speaking to you, saying, Gary doesn't know it, but he's talking to you. Because I'm calling you into a relationship with me. What the Bible tells us, that is in about 18 chapters after this one, Jesus had completed everything else that his Father had sent him to do, and he willingly laid down his life on a cross. And in doing so, Jesus paid the price for every lustful thought you've ever had, for every angry word you've ever spoken. The deepest and the darkest stains that sin has put on our hearts can be washed as white as snow. And that's what Jesus is doing right now. Not in five minutes. Not Sunday, right now. Jesus is calling every individual who doesn't know him into a relationship with him. If one of those people is you, in just a moment when we begin singing together, I'm going to ask you to slip right down to the front. You just take your pastor by the hand and say, I'd like to begin following Jesus. It would not surprise me, in fact, I'm fairly confident about it, if there are not some people who are here who would say, Gary, I am a Christian, but I am sitting at the tax table. I'm embarrassed by how I act. I'm ashamed of it. I say some things. I think a lot of things. I do some things that that do not fit the way a child of God is to act. I'm still sitting at the tax table. And I want to leave it behind me, just like Matthew did. I want want to live in the newness that Jesus brings. Well, if you're someone and you think that that applies to you, you just come right down to the front and say, Brother Dennis, I'm sitting at the tax table. He's heard the exact same sermon you have. He'll know exactly what you mean by that. You just say, I'm sitting at the tax table. Is there anyone here tonight who would say, Jesus has changed me. He has made me brand new. He took what was broken and he put it back together. He took what was wrong and made it right. And like Matthew, I at one time was sitting at a tax table. But I left it. But I look back at all the other people that I know who are still sitting there. And I want Jesus to use me. 
so that he can do in their lives what he did in mine and make them brand new creatures too. In whatever way God's Spirit speaks to you, I hope that you'll be obedient to that tonight. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing together. You come during our commitment time this evening.